Hey there, everyone. We're just letting everyone in. Uh, good to see some friends joining. Hello, Brianne. Hello, Shannon. Everyone, welcome. Uh, I'm just going to do a little bit of talking while we let everyone join. Um, and then we'll dive into all of our esteemed guests here and stuff. Um, firstly, my name is Zach Kupovsky. I'm uh, the uh, chair of the NDD, which is the National Directors Division uh, across the country at the DGC, as well as uh, work with uh, some of these fine folks at the Directors Caucus of the Directors Guild as well, where we oversee directors programs uh, and chats and training and all sorts of things to kind of get our directors uh, up and running and accelerating their careers as much as possible. Um, a few quick things just to talk about um, before we dive in as people are joining. Um, if you are a DGC member and you're watching uh, and you're not on directors.ca yet, uh, definitely do that. Directors.ca, if you don't know about it, is this incredible resource um, for decision makers who are hiring directors. Uh, you can check it out now at directors.ca. And uh, it has uh, all of these fine directors on there, as well as myself and all the directors, a lot of directors from across the country. And it's a really incredible tool um, for people that hire directors to find the perfect director for their show. Um, and so if you're a DGC member, director member, and you um, aren't up there yet, uh, you know who to email, either myself or Ryan Lino to get yourself up on there. Also uh, talking about an event that we have coming up to, uh, on the weekend is the T TV for Directing for TV workshop, which is coming up. And uh, that's an incredibly powerful event uh, that people, it's a two-day workshop, very, very detailed on sort of all of the specifics of directing for television. If any, uh, I think, uh, Kyle, have you done that before? Jem, I think you were you, you were a guest on that once, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we did one last year. Very intense workshop. Um, so if you're remember if you're looking to uh, to up your game on television, definitely check out the Directing for TV workshop. And then also we've got all our meet your matches that are happening over the next little while. So definitely um, check that out. We have one happening across the country for agents right now and a lot more happening for BC. So keep checking your emails for all those incredible events. Um, but uh, let's dive into what we're here to talk about today. First, before I introduce everyone, I really just uh, would first like to acknowledge the traditional Indigenous lands that we're all living on and gathered on today. And even though today we're talking online, um, and this, a lot of us are all over the country, we still all enjoy the pleasure of living and working in Indigenous uh, territory. So as a, uh, as a gesture of appreciation for the use of these lands, uh, I'd really like everyone, ask everyone to kind of offer a, a, a positive thought to the local Indigenous people where you live and hope for their health and wellness during this uh, time of uncertainty and insanity. Um, but so I, what we're here to do today is talk about basically what it means to be a creator in BC. Uh, what are the things that can lead to being a creator? What are the struggles uh, that creators come up against in BC? And we've got a fine panel here of creators, all writers and directors. Um, so creators in, with a capital C. Um, and first I wanted to uh, just have each of you guys uh, introduce yourself, give a little um, mini bio of who you are and the type of stuff that you make. Um, and then we'll dive in after that. So uh, Jim, why don't you start? Tell us about who you are and what you make. I know there's oh. some on the wall that might give it away, but. <laughs> hey everyone, uh, I'm Jem Garrod. I'm a writer and director and producer. Um, I started off in the indie world, uh, writing my own projects and um, uh, directing those projects as well. And, and um, you know, they got bigger and bigger slowly over the years. And um, over the last few years, I've mostly been working in episodic TV, both directing and writing, uh, creating and show running that as well. Awesome. Uh, why don't you pimp out your show that you created? What was it called? This one? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, in 2019 and uh, beginning of last year, um, I created and show ran a sci-fi show called Vagrant Queen, which was based on a comic book that I was asked to adapt. Um, we shot that in Cape Town and that was released last year. Um, and yeah, it was super fun experience. Um, loved it, loved running the room. I worked as the pilot director as well. 
Um, and that, and since that, that's led to a lot more um, opportunities and a lot more pitches and um, uh, yeah, a couple more projects in development um, at, a, at a sci-fi as well. So we'll talk more about development and how it's not just this beautiful, wonderful place where magic happens, uh, but uh, <laughs> we'll talk about the struggles. No, no development. sometimes it's awful. <laughs> yeah. um, Tariq, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, yes, uh, so I started out uh, uh, at UBC and then uh, for undergrad and for grad school, I went down to UCLA in the States. And then after that, I ended up uh, working in Afghanistan for four years. Uh, I'm originally from Afghanistan. I came here as a refugee when I was a kid. And uh, I, I spent, I did 25 hours of TV in Afghanistan and I ended up doing Sesame Street for the Afghanistan market for two years. Uh, and then after that, I came back in 2015 to Canada I brought back a film with me called Black Kite and ended up in TIFF and went to 20 festivals around the world and won uh, three Leos for uh, best film, best directing, best writing. Uh, and uh, yeah, since then I've been developing writing projects and also trying to break into TV as a director. And uh, uh, that has been going better since I joined a DGC. So uh so as you to see, that's been uh, something that's on an upswing. So that's a little about me. Thanks. We're not we're not paying him to say that. In fact, he's paying the DGC dues every year. So, um, well, I, have an, I have a fire truck going by like usual. Um, Asia, why don't you tell us about yourself and what you've been up to? Sure. Hi, my name is Asia Youngman. I am an Indigenous writer director based here in Vancouver. Um, I used to work as a visual effects artist. Um, I started out compositing um, pretty much after I graduated from Vancouver Film School and was with the company for about nine months working on you know some great projects but just realizing that I wanted to be a storyteller so I ended up leaving that company in 2018 to pursue um, filmmaking and started out doing documentary films my most recent doc was called The Synchronous Deep which premiered at TIFF um, it's currently streaming on CBC Gem and then since then just really been focusing on kind of transitioning into narrative um, as well as television. I directed my first episode of television last year um, as well as wrote and directed my first short narrative last year and recently won the DGC um, Emerging uh, Greenlight Award, which is great. So I'm excited to kind of explore um, that a bit more. Awesome, kicking ass. Um, and so Kyle, tell us about yourself. Um, yeah, I'm a director writer. I came up in the acting world. Um, so uh, I started in the, the indie side um, and it's kind of like directing, writing, producing just to be able to get your projects out there. I made an epic period drama called Edward, which won five audience choice awards, played festivals worldwide. And, and then that led to my second feature, Adventures in Public School, stars Judy Greer, Russell Peters, Grace Park. Um, and then sold to Netflix and premiered at TIFF, was named TIFF Top 10. And then that led into um, getting um, representation down in LA. And then I got, um, I, I rewrote a number of um, studio scripts and then sold an original pitch um, called Astrid's Death List to Paramount, um, working with Lorenzo Di Bonaventura um, producing. And then next up, I'm signed to direct this kind of original comedy adventure feature that we're going to hopefully, you know, go to the UK to shoot. Um, and then I'm really starting to try to transition into television, into creating TV and directing TV and yeah. Awesome. Tell us the story of how you got the money to shoot Edward, your first film. I did a short film called Hop the Twig where I was acting at Bart on the Beach in town here. And then I got a wedding cinematographer to be my DP because I didn't know any DPs. And that film ended up winning um, on the CBC short film Face Off and I got $40,000 to make another short film. So I used that money to put into a feature and I cut CBC a short film from it and then shot Edward, and then raised some private equity, and it was about $130,000. So you took their short film money and you made a feature film, with it, which I think is brilliant, brilliant way of doing it. So um, before we dive into the rest of the conversation, anyone who has any questions um, who is watching, uh, there's two ways you can interact with us, and we really want you to, to do so. Um, I know a lot of you are directors yourselves and writers. Um, you can either write your question into the Q&A button 
at the bottom of your screen, or you can raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, be prepared for your camera to turn on because uh, we'll bring you on the show and you can ask your question uh, in person. But uh, with all you guys here, you know, I, I really wanted to just kind of create a roundtable discussion where we can all just discuss what it means to be a creator in, in BC and, and what are the benefits, what are the struggles um, and, and, and how to get things moving. Um, I'm curious, and, and I don't know if anyone wants to jump in, like, what, do, what did you guys find were the things that helped you break through initially as a creator in BC? What were the, what were the avenues that you found that it's different for every person because every person sort of gets their momentum in a different way. But I'm just curious for each of you, like when you were trying to go from having never created anything to now having created stuff, what were the things that helped you get over that first hurdle? Well, for me, yeah. it was, it was um, actually to try to get, I was trying to get, you know, money and support to make a short film, the very first thing. And I knew it was, it, it just was really hard. And so I just fronted the money and just made the short on my own and just made it really cheap to then be able to start showing that I could do it. It's like, you know, you can't get that job without having the, the proof. And then I went to telefilm trying to make this epic period film and, and they said no, and I'd won on the CBC and I had the short, but that wasn't enough. So then um, we ended up, you know, shooting the movie, but getting the train going was what really helped. And having the CBC money meant the train started, like there's money attached and then it's easier to get stuff on. So it's trying to get that initial movement. If it's just mm -hmm. something, uh, like a script and there's nothing else going on with it you know starting to add attachments is what kind of pushed it forward for me mm -hmm. yeah I found that as well and that's certainly what I did is uh keep creating my own content as well you know it was um it's it's hard to get hired on something if you if you haven't done it um and so you know coming from in back, I was sort of used to writing and creating, producing a lot of my own projects and would put a lot of my own money into them as well. And, and obviously go for, uh, you know, a lot of grants and, and try to find funding elsewhere. Um, but I just, whenever I wasn't getting paid to do it, that didn't stop me. I just, I just kept creating and creating a body of work until, you know, you get that first uh, kind of professional gig and, and it sort of it went from there and then even stepping into show running was was because of that work you know that I had that I had done um creating my own content I was known as a director and so um you know a lot of show runners traditionally come up through the room um and and I had been working as a director and so you know they had a kind of trust in me um in in terms of how I would direct the project and how I kind of saw it and you know the um that visual language I would bring to it but in terms of running the room um you know they were it was there was an uncertainty and I was sort of able to bring up a lot of the early work I produced and a lot of scripts that I'd written that that I'd just written for me um you know I wasn't getting paid to write them and so uh, all of that combined really helped me land that gig and you wrote a pilot that they liked. Uh, that helped, yeah. <laughs> so you could show your, your writing there. Um, mm -hmm. Tariq, you, know, made, you made your film uh, Black Kite. Was it, where did the, was that basically made um, with no money? Like, was it basically made while you were in Afghanistan or was it? We made in Afghanistan, but uh, uh, we got a lot of funding from uh, Canada Council of Arts, BC Council of Arts, and it, it wouldn't have been possible to uh, complete uh, the film without that uh, because the, the film was shot in uh, Dari. Uh, we weren't uh, eligible for funding from Telefilm, so which was a total bummer when you, you come back and you work so hard in this project and, and then they say no. Um, they did give us some marketing and promotional budget after the film was made. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I feel like in BC, have it, I was away for from 2005 until 2015. So there's some perspective. When I was here in 2005, I shot my short, first short film here. And then when I came back in 2015, not only did I not recognize the city with all the high rises that have been you know, bloomed up over the years, 
but it was all, also uh, the amount of uh, the crews were incredible here, like director of photography, gaffers. It seemed like uh, this town like uh, blew up in, in, in the 10 years I was away in terms of uh, talent. So uh, I think that um, uh, to, to answer your question of like, uh, what are the advantages of starting out in BC? I think that's one of the advantages that there are so many talented people here and if you, it, it would be nice to get some funding for uh, some more local funding for uh, shorts and things like that from, uh, 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 there'd be more sources than just BC Arts Council. Uh, yeah. I know Creative BC has some more sources, but those shorts, those initial shorts really, really uh, help um, a creative uh, throughout their whole career. And, uh, and, and they say that you have like, you know, there's a saying that you, every director has like a hundred bad films in them. They have to get them out. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, it's like, it's, it's a hard craft. And so the, our crews are good because they get so much practice on these big shows. Uh, but our creators also need to get uh, those film, short films done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's something I think a lot about. Um, I find one of the, it's sort of the golden handcuff, I think, of, of Canada and BC is... We do have more, we do have some grants. We don't have lots, but we do have places people can go. Um, but I I find a lot of filmmakers basically don't make stuff unless they get the grant. So like, there's all these grants that are there to accelerate careers, and and and, and a lot of you guys have have participated in those, and that's awesome. Maybe that is the reason you're here today. But I also meet a lot of filmmakers who apply to grants, and they just don't get them, and so they make mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. And so I think that whereas in the U.S. and places that don't have a granting system, it forces people to be self-starters because that's the only option. You, you, you're going to have to get convince people to get together, give them pizza, like shoot stuff, put it on YouTube. You're, you're going to have to self-generate um, before you have money because there's no opportunity for putting in an application and waiting for the money. So I've always been of two minds. I think the grants are great, but I think there's a poison that a lot of Canadians have in their soul, which is well, I didn't get telefilm, so I guess I'm not making a movie this year. Mm -hmm. And I think telefilm's awesome and you should try and get telefilm, but you should have a film you, you can make even if you don't get telefilm. And I think that's something I, I always kind of struggle with. I'm curious what you guys think about that. I don't yeah, know, Asia, I can... Asia, I'm curious to kind of what your thoughts are. Um, in terms of, sorry, telefilm. But just kind of applying to grants but also creating stuff outside of the grants. Yeah, I mean, like, so my first couple of films that I made, it was just like, like the first one I made, I barely had a budget for it. I didn't get any sort of like formal funding. It was more just something that I was doing like in my spare time while I was at film school. Um, and it was just more of like a passion project for me. So I think just, you know, I was at the point where I had to do everything myself. Like, not that I wanted to, but it was more of like a necessity. So I was like producing and editing and shooting it and all that sort of thing. So. You know, of course, the first few projects I did, I was sort of like wearing all of the hats. Um, and then it wasn't until the third project I did, which was this Inker and Zebra, it was like my first sort of like director for hire and I could just focus on story, um, which was so exciting just to not have to do everything and be able to collaborate with other people. Um, so I think too, like there's always, even now with like pitching projects, like, you know, I'm working on um, a feature documentary with Kat Jeannie we're co-directing together and like we've been pitching and working on this project for two years now and we recently got it greenlit which is really exciting but you know we did get turned down by almost everyone and we were still just like seeking other ways of getting the film made and you know I think it's sometimes it just takes a lot of work but if you're really passionate about the story like you'll find a way to, to get it done and to get it made and so if you just if you get turned down by say like you know one of our major kind of funding bodies in Canada it doesn't necessarily mean it won't get made. Yeah, do any of the others have thoughts on that? Well, no, I, I agree. I think uh, you're always going to get a lot of rejection in this industry. You're going to get turned down a lot and um, and it's and it's really tough and it sucks and it's difficult. Um, but like Asia said, you got to have that that passion in your project and in your voice and 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 keep going and keep finding another way to to make it happen. I do find that I um, I've learned how to juggle multiple projects at once because I find that, you know, of those 10, one will happen if I'm lucky. Um, 
Yeah. And so, yeah, I think, you know, you've got to kind of, you, when those rejections hit, you've got to find a way to keep going and find a way to, um, you know, keep that passion for your, for your, uh, for your projects going. I've been, I've been juggling a lot of projects as well, but I have this app on my computer that blocks like Facebook and Reddit and stuff every time, like during the working day so that I can't use it. And instead it shows you inspirational quotes. And one of the, <laughs> one of the quotes was, uh, a pro they're all proverbs, but one was a man who chases two rabbits catches neither. And I was so like, it kept coming up and I'm juggling like 10 projects and I'm like, oh man, is the reason none of these happening because I'm chasing too many things. But then my, my co-director was like, yes, but don't put all your eggs in one basket. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, I like, and, and I, and I put both of those questions on Twitter. I, I was like, <laughs> and then it just, rabbits catches neither or put, and, and it, I put it as a vote and it was 50, 50. So then I was yeah. like, well, I don't know what you do. It's so, it's so tough. And I, and I juggled with that for a long time with, um, uh, you know, like I should really be focusing on this, but all oh, this really excites me and all oh, this is more shiny right now. Um, and it, it, it really comes out. It wasn't a, a lack of focus. It really, it, it's taken me a while to, to learn how to jump between them and how to uh, give them all the kind of time and commitment that they need to succeed, but how to kind of keep multiple uh, multiple projects going at the same time. Because I think you really- What was it that you learned? I think Adam's that. right. I think he, you really do need to, you really do need to kind of uh, have a few on the go. So what did you learn that lets you do that well? Um, Every project usually is uh, that that I'm working on is at a different stage of development, which helps. So um, it helps to sort of um, polish up a, a draft, um, you know, in the morning on this day, and then that afternoon work on uh, something which is very early in the pitch stages. That's on the package that's that's just about to go out. And so I find that having them all at different stages really helps. Um, and then. It, and then it was just really working around how what I need to be creative. And I found that actually um, kind of jumping between projects during my work week uh, keeps everything exciting. And that uh, I, I work really well that way rather than dedicating this week just to this project and next week just to this project. Awesome. Uh, I think Kyle, you wanted to say something about the, the um, grants? Well, yeah, I was going to say another thing that has been helpful, which we talked about um, yesterday, is to, you know, you take your project and you're like, oh, this is going to be, you know, a feature or a TV series, but to be able to go, you know, maybe start pivoting the project if you get, you get, you know, doors closing on you. I took a project down as a TV series to LA and then we just decided to turn it into a feature and then take it back out. And that was the project that sold at Paramount. Um, and so to be able to go out to grants in, and be able to pivot the projects has been really helpful for us. And, and when you own your own project, you're able to exhaust all the options of going, okay, I'm gonna take it as a feature, I'm gonna take mm -hmm. it as a TV series. Yeah, I think that's the secret. That's really the biggest lesson I've learned in the last few years is being a creator, someone who originates an idea, um, not only does it allow you to be a self-starter and, and have opportunities when maybe no other opportunities are coming, but probably equally as important because you originated it, you own it. And so, so many projects in this industry sort of go and then don't go. <laughs> they get sort of bought and, but then actors don't show up and then whatever the money is, whatever. if you were the one who originated it, if in the likely scenario, which is that it doesn't get made, it comes back to you. And you get to then try again, either make it into mm -hmm. a podcast, make it into a comic book, make it into a movie five years from now, once you've won an Oscar, whatever the, if you've originated it, it's yours forever. Um, whereas if, if you're pitching on other people's stuff, um, or if you're pitching on books and IP that other people own, that they're asking you to adapt, if it doesn't go ahead, they own it. Mm -hmm. And so all that work kind of goes down the drain. And so there's a huge strength in sort of creating your own, your own stuff because it, all that energy you put into it is sort of there forever and you can pull it out at any time. I was curious for you guys, what does it mean? I think some of the people might find this really interesting, which is like a lot of us write and we do create our own stuff, but we also do stuff for hire, like you were saying, Asia. 
when it's not your own, when it's not something you wrote, is your process any different? How do you, how do you still um, make it your own as a director if you weren't the one who created it? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think it's, you know, it's exercising different muscles. I love being a director for hire as well. I love kind of going into a project that um, it's been established, it has a style, it has a tone, and your job really becomes about sort of just doing the best kind of uh, job possible during, you know, that, that block or, you know, the time that you're on set. Um, I, I really enjoy it. I think it actually, uh, I love that I get to do that and that breaks up, you know, the, the projects that I'm creating because the projects I'm creating really, um, when they sell, they're great. When you, when, when, when you pitch is exciting, but really most of the time it's you sitting at home on your own in your writing cave with your own thoughts for a really long time. And, uh, and uh, it's it's either thrilling or it's exhausting. It's sort of really not, for me at least, a, a middle ground with writing. Um, and so I, you know, I love being able to to go out as a director for hire as well um, and connect with other creatives and crews um, and work with actors. And um, yeah, I think you know you very quickly get used to the the. You, you know how to how to work in that in that area how to adapt to uh, someone else's show and someone else's vision um on your project asia, cool. yeah i was gonna ask asia what you know when you collaborated on that project you were mentioning and it wasn't it sounded like you said it was a something you jumped onto what was that experience like how did you make it your own um i mean it was pretty quick though, overall like i was hired in December of 2018 and we were filming like a month later and then we delivered it I think like two months after that so it was a really quick turnaround and you know we were traveling across Canada within the span of a week so it was really rushed but I mean it's a bit different with documentary too because I feel like you know you can kind of just although I you know come prepared it's like sometimes you're not really sure what's going to happen on the day you know the story could go in a completely different direction you have to be always like willing to adapt um so of course, you know, I had a vision in my mind and just worked closely with the cinematographer I was working with. And um, we had, you know, the same vision in mind, we're on the same page. And so of course, just like, we had to just go and do the interviews and see what happened. Um, but I guess what I found with like, for example, I, so I directed an episode of Odd Squad Mobile Unit last November and pretty much Jem said it all. Like, you know, you're there to just kind of make sure that the showrunner is happy and that it looks like other episodes and it has the same feel, um, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I also kind of wanted there to be something that I could bring to just kind of change things if that was something that people were open to. So, you know, just in my conversations with like the showrunner and with the cinematographer, I was like, well, have you ever done like an overhead shot? And they're like, no, I'm like, well, would you be open to doing one? And they're like, yeah, sure. So that was kind of something small that I could bring that didn't change, you know, um, the feeling of like the entire show or the look of the show, but it was still something that I felt that I contributed. So um, you know, there's kind of little wins like that. You can just kind of sneak in once in a while, as long as, you know, the showrunner is willing to work with you on that. Totally. Yeah. And, and that's exactly right. Like there's always, if, if you're an episodic director, there's always something you can bring unique to the project, whether that is, you know, like Asia said, uh, suggesting shots that they haven't tried before, um, or, uh, or how you work with actors. You know, Zach, I remember when we worked on Mech X4, we had those discussions, right? Like what can each director bring that we haven't, that previous directors haven't tried? There's always those discussions, you know, showrunners are always excited to, to hear those ideas. So there's, there's still an incredible amount of creativity involved in being an episodic director. For sure. Asia, talk to me what sort of, what's the landscape like right now for documentary filmmakers in BC? What are the, what are the good things? What are the bad things? Like if you're, you know, if you're in that space? Um, well, COVID's making it very hard right now to film anything. Um, What's that? Sorry? What's that? <laughs> Never heard of well, that. Well, you haven't been outside yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just sort of, I guess just thinking about the project, like I'm in pre-production right now on a feature doc and 
it's just a lot of waiting like we're just having to kind of wait and see what happens like we have an intent of you know filming in june as well as august but what we're going to kind of just wait and see what happens um it is my first time working with like an american network so it's it's a new process for me but um it's What's easier. been the difference uh working with an american network well, i'm not sure yet <laughs> <laughs> i'm soon to find out um but i think just, i mean i I feel like there's a lot of opportunities right now for doc like in a way I feel like it is possible to film safely depending on what you know your subject matter is because there's just a bit of freedom of having like a smaller crew um just having a bit more over like control over you know your interview kind of environment that you're working with um things like that so from what I've heard it sounds like there are quite a lot of doc projects that are moving forward right now which is exciting and I think too, just like realizing that there's so much we could do remotely, like even just working with an editor remotely was like a new thing um, that I did with the Odd Squad, for example. And I just feel like it works. Like obviously it's not quite as exciting as being in the room with an editor and just kind of like feeding off each other, but it's still doable. So I feel like things mm -hmm. are moving forward right now. Awesome, well, big news. Stop the presses, we got our first question. So from the audience, so uh, let's, Let's lead by example. We're going to answer this question so that everyone else wants to uh, ask questions as well. It's for you, Tariq, um, asking about basically what your process was like making Black Kite. I mean, I can only imagine, uh, you know, shooting shooting that film in Afghanistan must have been a very unique process. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, so uh, working in Afghanistan is very challenging because things change all the time, um, and. Uh, we had uh, what I had to do in that film was that it was a short story that I'd written a long time ago, and uh, uh, I had the story in it, and I kind of ha had all the scenes ordered that I wanted to do. And what I did with the actors was I improvised a lot of the scenes. Um, I, I couldn't find my own, uh, you know, I couldn't find a, a direct photography, so I had to shoot it myself. Uh, it was uh, completely, I guess. Uh, um, uh, you, you know, uh, we had to basically take all our equipment and everything and pile it in the backs of a, a taxi cab in the morning, go off on uh, somewhere to shoot. Um, I kind of had to shoot uh, all in incognito and not let anyone know that we were, uh, we were filming something because uh, the Taliban had decided to wage war on the government at the time uh, because the, the, the Afghan government sign this contract that they'll stay there for five years. Uh, and, and they weren't very happy about that. Um, so the, the process was to keep it very loose, improvise. Uh, and we, you know, electricity goes down all the time. Uh, luckily, the, uh, the Sony A7S had just come out. So ended up shooting it on a DSLR. And, uh, and yeah, and we heard like, uh, hardly knew what we had until we got back here. And then when I saw the, what we had, I was utterly depressed. I was completely uh, destroyed. Uh, and I thought of taking the hard drive and like throwing it to the wall. And then, <laughs> it. And then uh, I had uh, my partner, she edited uh, the first version of the film and uh, we sent that to the arts council and and then they sent us back that the, the jury unanimously thought that we should finish a film. Blah, blah, blah. And that gave me, so yes, I, and to answer your last question, I totally agree with you. How I got started, I got a really, really good uh, tip from uh, one of my profs and was like, you know, these, these DSLRs are out now. Why don't you just get one and shoot as much stuff as possible? And so uh, I bought the Canon 5D and I shot a whole bunch of stuff that I haven't shown anybody. And I just, you know, and uh, uh, and uh, it's just uh, uh, non-existent anymore. But I shot tons of stuff. Threw it against the wall and and yeah. uh, <laughs> broke up into many pieces. Yeah, and it, and it got I got better and better. And then when it came time to shoot black kite, and I didn't have a cinematographer, I didn't have stuff like that. I had the confidence to go out there and do it on my own. And I knew enough about lighting. I knew uh, about working with actors and things like that. That uh, it was when you have all those tools you're kind of uh, unstoppable, right? As a filmmaker, it's like, uh, and, and as a director, as a creator, you should know everything on set. You should know how uh, things are done and who's doing what and and have been on their shoes. I think that makes for a better director. Um, but yeah, that was, that was, that was the culmination of that. 
Sorry? Where can people see the film? Oh, we sold it to Amazon. So you can see it on Amazon if you like to see it. Yeah. There you go. You almost threw it against the wall. Yeah. And then you bought a bunch of Leos and you sold it to Amazon. So, I mean, every film I've ever shot, you get to the edit room and you think you've completely failed. Yeah. Uh, and then every day it gets a little bit better. Yeah. Um, okay, curious... edit is. Yeah, they save, they save us. Um, On US stuff. I'm curious, just like, what is the difference between the Canadian systems as a creator and the US systems as a creator? And, and what are the benefits and pitfalls of both? I'm just, you know, as people mm. that are, are creating, that are watching and listening right now, like, and they're thinking, should I take this to Bell or should I take this to ABC? Yeah. You know, just what are, what are the, what are, what's the landscape between those? Because we're in BC, we're sort of, a, a, a melting pot of those two places. Uh, we're in Canada technically, but 98% of what shoots here is US based. So okay. talk to us about the difference there. I mean, I think there's like a hybrid where it kind of both exists now to, you know, working on Canadian content and selling it to an American audience. Like a lot of the projects I'm working on now, um, you know, the first discussion is really who we're going to partner with, uh, what production company and producers we're going to bring on board. Um, and then that often leads to those other discussions of, you know, where are we, where are we going to take this? Um, and it's sort of never just, you know, let's focus on the American market or let's focus on the Canadian market. It's sort of the, the plan is usually involves a sort of strategy to work with both, at least, at least I've noticed recently and um, the, the projects I'm, I'm working on. Um, I think being specifically a BC creator has its challenges and advantages. Um, it feels right now though that there that it's sort of the two sides of the same coin, you know, like uh, a lot of the or almost sort of the our broadcaster and studio headquarters are in Ontario and we have been uh, BC has been underrepresented. Um, definitely, but that discussion is actually happening now and I'm noticing that discussion more. And so I'm finding that there are, that, that while, we're, while there's, we're still up underrepresented, there's the projects coming out of BC are carefully considered. Um, at least that's sort of been my experience lately and, and sort of what's happening when I'm in generals and the conversation that, that's, that's happening um, in the room. And so, it sort of feels like right now we, you know, that is, it's it's strange because it's both a, a challenge and an advantage right now. Like you know, for BC creators, um, uh, partner with a good team. It is it is about you know, you're, you're as good as the people you surround yourself with, and and get those projects out there because they are being considered. Yeah, well said, uh, Kyle. What's been your experience between because you've you've made Canadian features and you've you've uh, sold stuff to the US and sort of as a creator, how do you navigate both worlds? Um, I was just sitting there trying to think about it. Yeah, I, I think I've mainly worked in the US just as um, a writer on the projects and have been attached as a director to a few. Um, um, yeah, it feels kind of similar. I mean, between the two, it doesn't feel like there's a, a drastic difference. I mean, with the US, I felt like there's some much more colorful personalities down there as you work with more experienced producers, especially older producers. Um, um, I, uh, and then, yeah, as for the Canadian side, I mean, I, I felt like, um, you know, it's very supportive of, uh, you know, getting your project up and going. And I feel like in the American side, they're a bit, they can be a bit more direct. And then at the same time, you go into those meetings in LA and you have no, everyone is that, that LA thing of everyone's so polite and nice and smiling. You're like, I cannot tell at all. And sometimes the Canadians are more direct of like, yeah, you know, but in a polite way, yeah. um, which is strange. And then as for taking the project out of which where we decide to go, I meant, like Jim said, of just picking your partners really carefully. Um, but we usually try to take it out first in the US. 
Um, but I, you know, with my projects, I'll do a Canadian, one that's catered to Canadians and one that's catered to Americans, like, like the same project, I'll tweak locations and, you know, make the script Canadian spelling and American mm -hmm. spelling for which market I'm taking it out to. Um, yeah. Yeah, for me, it's been interesting because if you ask CRA or Cavco, Freaks is not a Canadian movie <laughs> because it doesn't have Canadian actors in it. Um, but every other part of it was basically Canadian. Um, but we, our approach to making the film was to was American. It was like sell it to Americans, mar have mar Americans market it, have Americans distribute it, even though it's created by Canadians and shot shot with Canadians and half the money was from Canadians. Um, it's, it's interesting that sort of the blend there, that's been my approach, which is to make stuff in Canada, but sort of put it through the Americans uh, distribution system so that, it, cause I think some of the deficits that Canada has is if you truly make it through the Canadian system, once it's done, it's hard to have anyone notice it because there just isn't the gun, there isn't the gunpowder to kind of fight against the American marketing system. And so the Canadian marketing system just basically gets ignored. Um, so that's always been my approach is sort of make Canadian stuff and then slip it to the Americans and have them sell it. <laughs> yeah, I did the same thing with uh, public school that it was eventually in public school that you know couldn't show the flag the outside the school. They were like pulling the flag down but we don't show which country it's in. And then <laughs> money, we went to American money. Um, well, like it, that even if it's was challenging too. Like when I had freaks at TIFF, we had this meeting with all the other filmmakers at TIFF um, about a month beforehand, all the other Canadian filmmakers. Um, and all the other Canadian filmmakers were there. It was like Canadian filmmaker day to help us have a good TIFF. And it came, the conversation came around to, to marketing and press. And we were the only film there that had a US publicist. Um, and it didn't occur to any of the other Canadian, the, the films that were there to have a US publicist. And I can tell you it made a huge difference when getting US press, which made a huge mm -hmm. difference in getting a US sale, it didn't make the film any less Canadian. It was just, we wanted that machine to be working on our behalf and, and, and it did. Um, we've, got, we've ended up getting a lot of great questions. So I wanna dive into some of these. Um, Lucy Guest, who's a, a director in BC, had a, had a great question about, um, what is your prep process like? How is it different when mm. it's something you've created and something you're creating for someone else, how you how you prepare it, which I think is always really interesting because every director prepares differently. Um, yeah. How is it different when you're um, like Asia when you were doing that episode um, when you were prepping? How is that different from when you're prepping your own thing? I think if like if it's like a script breakdown, I don't think it's that different for me in terms of how I I prep that stuff, but. I think what I'm finding now is because like I incorporated my own production company. So like I'm executive producing my, my personal projects now. Um, so I find that I obviously have a lot more responsibility on these personal projects because like I'm hiring and I just have to make more decisions. Um, whereas it's a bit different with the show because like, I mean, obviously you have your prep process but you're coming in and then you're coming out and you do have like an edit session but you're not in it for as long of a haul, I guess you could say. Like, I feel like Jem could probably speak better to this because, you know, Jem's worked as like a showrunner, but that's sort of just been what I've experienced so far in terms of how I prep for things. And yeah, I think it just comes out mm. to having more responsibility. Yeah, for me, uh, it does change the prep process quite a bit when I've written something. Um, and, you know, I don't know if other writer directors work this way, but um, when I write something, I, I can visualize it, I see it in my head, I see exactly what it looks like. I see uh, the shots, I see it cut together. Um, it sort of, it comes comes with it, with the, with the writing. And so when I'm prepping something I've written, it's so clear in my mind that part's kind of done. And I, I spend that prep time kind of working uh, mostly on other things, you know, um, I communicate that vision uh, early on and then that time is spent sort of in, in other areas of prep and when you're coming in as a director for hire uh, I do spend a lot of that prep time kind of trying to uh, learn and absorb as much as I can about that show um, if there are other seasons I'll watch those or if there's been other episodes even if they're in 
you know, just uh, rough cuts, I'll watch those. I'll just, I'll spend a lot of time on absorbing as much as I can on a project uh, that's not mine. And I spend a lot longer than considering uh, visually then what will it, what can I bring? What will I do? Um, so that's how it differs from me during prep. Yeah, you made me think of something. Actually, the first film I ever made, which was a sci-fi channel monster movie about a bunch of people being eaten in the woods by a giant man-eating Tasmanian devil. What I learned, the biggest thing I learned on that project was exactly what you were just talking about, Jim, that when I read a script, I can see the film. I'm basically, as I'm reading it, I'm seeing every shot, I'm hearing the music. I, I can basically, as if I'm watching the movie and then all I have yeah. to go in, I've already seen the movie, so now I just have to go shoot it. I thought everyone could do that. Um, I thought everyone has that skill because it's only ever been my experience. And what I learned on that movie is that Almost nobody has that ability. <laughs> and that especially the producers and executive producers don't have that ability. They have the ability of when they see it, they react to it and go, that's right or that's wrong. But they, they, don't have, they are not very good at, at imagining what it's going to be. And I, so I didn't do any work on that project to, I just assumed, well, we've all read the script and I've seen it in my head. They all saw the same thing as what was in my head. So even though it's their script and their project, I'm just going to do what, what's there. And I did it and was shocked to learn that they had pictured something completely different. <laughs> um, and so then what I've done way more on projects that are other people's is when it's your own project, even if other producers are involved, there's a lot more. They just think you have the vision and they're just sort of on board for your vision. But when it's their project, I do a huge amount to make sure even before taking the job, because you don't want to take a job when you realize half halfway through that they have a different vision for what this project should be than what your vision is. And so I do a huge amount of prep work to understand the tone that's in their mind and also to communicate the tone that's in my mind and to make sure that those tones are the same by showing images, by talking about movies, by showing clips from movies, by um, editing together clips from movies to say, you know, by playing music, by, you know, just yeah. I can so that everyone by the time we're rolling everyone is seeing the same movie um, especially the people that could fire me so that once we get to the edit where it's too late to change it that now we're just executing on that tone to me that that is sort of the biggest shift whereas yeah. when it's your own thing everyone just you can kind of just execute and it's up to you to kind of just bring it home and if it, if it sucks it's your fault Tone, tone is so important. I And it's funny when you in episodic that the tone meeting is always scheduled last in prep. You know, it's just we'll, we'll shove it here. Um, I usually like to request it earlier. I like to get in the showrunner's mind a lot earlier and kind of make sure that what I'm reading, what I'm interpreting is right. We're on, you know, tonally we're on the same page because I find that that does work into uh everything else from that point, from how I talk to actors, from how I, you know, create shot lists. Totally. The, um, I'm about to go do a show next week and we had the tone meeting yesterday, which is like nice. we're starting prep next week. And because the script yeah. it was a show where the scripts happened to already be written before they started shooting. So yeah. they're not playing catch up. And so we were able to have a tone meeting before we even started prep, which, so for any directors that are listening, that are it's doing so that, good. Get I, I, phone meeting as early as possible. It's it's going to save you so much headache. Go ahead, Tree. I also think that it's really important to find. Uh, I approach like a work that if it's some something else, some somebody else has written it, I'm going to direct it. Is for me, what's really important is to approach it as an actor and really uh, try to find my way into uh, the protagonist. Like ask a series of questions, do a lot of research, find out you know, ask why, 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 like a little kid, and get to the heart of What's at stake? Why are they doing this? Um, and so for myself to uh, to feel for this character, to find empathy. And, and if I can't, then uh, it's good to, uh, to use substitution or things like that to, because if you don't find that thing that you can latch onto, uh, it's really hard then to kind of make it your own or give it your own voice, right? Or feel passionate about it because it is a lot of work and you want to feel excited when you go in and be like, this is the story I'm telling. And I really, you know, and it, and it has to be something personal that I can connect with on a personal level. And that's what I find that's important for me. Absolutely. 
There's another great question here. We've got lots of questions rolling in now, finally. After 50 minutes, people figured it out. Um, so it's kind of a long question, but I'll just summarize it. It's, it's from someone who's basically um, in their 50s. They're an editor and they're asking, can someone in their 50s start making short films and in indies and basically become a director or, or is it too late? Um, it's never too late. Is it too late? <laughs> no, no, you know, it's never too late. Um, and you're, I was just reading that question. And the fact that you're an editor as well is awesome. You know story so well, you know how to craft story. You've probably, I was just reading, I can't see Zach, uh, how many years uh, this person had been editing, but, you know, I'm assuming you've come across so many uh, stories um, and you've got your own to tell and you've got your own voice um, and I personally would love to see uh, and you know what you come up with if you've, you've spent decades editing um, and you want to direct uh, I would love to see what that short looks like absolutely get out there and do that yeah everyone has different point of view uh, in different ages so if you come the thing is when you come on when you come, it takes a long, long time to learn this stuff, I feel, especially directing or especially being creator, because uh, there's so many parts to juggle and there's so many parts to master. But I feel like even the process of learning is different than if you learned in your 30s, if you learn in your 20s. Uh, I'd be interested in seeing the work of a person who uh, learned in their 50s how to do this stuff, because it would be fascinating to see what kind of stuff that you, you, you that you'd make with going totally. through that process. Um, like we've all, yeah. yeah, we've all just been chatting about the mistakes that, that we've all made and all the stuff we shot on, you know, DSLRs that no one will ever see because it's awful. And, and we've all done that. And I think as an editor working for that long, you've seen other people make those mistakes. You've seen probably all the mistakes. Um, I think, uh, yeah, you would have learned so much. Yeah, absolutely. Go do it. And there's, um, and there's examples. There's some friends of ours uh, in BC. I'm thinking of, uh, of Heather Hawthorne Doyle as a great example. Um, mm -hmm. Just a few years ago, she had a career in, in live television. So directing award shows and concerts and, and factual and, but wanted, you know, her kids were grown up. She wanted to get into narrative episodic directing and had the same question. Is it, am I too late? You know, mm -hmm. basically all her kids were grown up by that point. Um, I don't know what age she was, but you know, had the same question and really what she did is she started doing the doing the work she started the biggest thing is is it too late for me to direct well it is if you're not going to go out and start directing the biggest thing is to start directing start mm -hmm. making short films start making content even if it's small stuff so that people stop seeing you as an editor and start seeing you as a director and from that work you know, she was doing lots of short films. She was observing lots of sets. She was calling everyone she knew that, that she'd worked with that now was doing something. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now just, just in four years, now she's, a, um, you know, she's doing lots of MOWs and she's um, in the room for all these different directing jobs. So mm -hmm. like she's completely transformed her career um you know after having a full long career in another in another medium but the first step was creating a bunch of content uh that, that she self-generated herself and some of it was grants some of it was just her putting her money on the line and, and making stuff and so just like how they tell if you want to be a writer write. if you want to be a director you have to start directing so that people start seeing you as a director and they can see your work and like any director at any age like like Tariq was saying who, the type of director, your voice, what you have to say um, is always the paramount thing. Like there's always gonna be lots of directors to choose from. And the thing that differentiates you when a certain opportunity comes along is whatever your thing is that no one else can do. Um, and that doesn't matter with age. In fact, with age, you might have a lot more of things that only you can do that no one else can. So just really leaning into what makes you specific and then making making that stuff to prove it. And then the opportunity and, and getting rebranding yourself as a director and having people know you're a director will kind of help that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and it has happened. So um, another question here, uh, sort of a quick question, but um, it came up, uh, Jim, when you're talking about generals, we actually have an entire course about generals at the DGC mm -hmm. called how to get hired, pitch and sell. So if you're a DGC member, look out for that course, because it's all about how to ace generals. 
but Jem uh, and Kyle and Asia or Tariq, any of you who've, who've had generals, how do you go in and, and turn a general into a job? Um, you cut out from me just on that last bit, and I don't know if, if it's me yeah, cutting sorry. out, but let how me do know you, if it is. Uh, I'll change my internet as you're answering this question, but how do you turn a general into a job? Oh, good question. Um, yeah, generals, generals, uh, I honestly try to have fun in generals. Um, you know, they're usually not about a particular project. Sometimes they might be, but some, most of the time it really is just making connections. And so I go in, you know, having researched the company I'm about to talk to, the individual I'm about to talk to. Um, and really the whole point of a general is to try and have uh, some sort of kind of personal connection. You know, you, you wanna talk a bit about work, uh, what you're great at, what you've done, uh, talk about a bit about what they do, but then kind of make it personal as well. Um, I found I found that that's that's really important, and that's what these people we're meeting kind of want as well. That you know they have a lot of these. They want to like you. They want to remember you. Um, and Zach, we've had this chat before. After generals, because you'll have so many, I like to make sure that I'm keeping notes of who I've met with. Um, what we spoke about, you know, any kind of small, small piece from that meeting that makes me stand out. Um, and to, to make a general, to turn a general into a job, it's really then about following up on that relationship, um, keeping in, in contact, letting them know when uh, something new and interesting and big that you're working on is happening. Um, and it really is about creating that kind of lasting relationship. And most likely if it's gonna turn into a job, it might not be until a couple of years when they've got something and your name pops up on their desk and they're like, oh yeah, I know this person. I like this person. Um, that's usually how it happens. Um, and it's, it, yeah, it's not an instant uh, reward. It's it's time and it's effort and it's building relationships and you do that with uh, a lot of people and um, that's how it turns into jobs. Yeah, Kyle, what's your approach? Um, yeah, I agree with everything Jim just said. And I also think it's um, the job is like so far away. It's kind of like thinking, how can I get another meeting um, rather than a job or getting hired? And so get into another conversation. How does this lead into, you know, another a further chat. Um, I, I lucked out on doing my first round in LA. Oh, the other thing I would say is taking the timing, the general is really important too. So when you have momentum with say, you mm. know, like when Black Kite is at TIFF or whatever, or, you know, Freaks is going out to theaters, like taking the meeting right then going, that's when I'm going to try to schedule my meeting so that you're going in with energy already. And they, and then you are your your agent or manager can kind of prep them, but you can also you know drop it too. And um, but I lucked out on my first one because I decided to do a soft pitch of the feature, um, and that was Lorenzo Di Ventura's company. And then we took it out right after that when I partnered with the producers, and then that's the project that sold to Paramount. So that was just from a general and. You know, I don't know if just pitching is a good idea, but we kind of sussed out the room and it was like, you know, we talked for a little bit and said, well, we've actually got some projects that we're going to be bringing down. Here's where they're at. And then they were like, oh my gosh, this is what we're actually looking for is this witch project. And we're like, oh, well, we can, we've got to, we kind of prepped like a five to 10 minute pitch. And then, um, so it's also this kind of like, it's like a bit of a game where you can see how the meeting's gonna go and you, you know, it's not like you can go in with like a set plan every time with those meetings. You, you have to be able to be flexible and, and adjust. It's almost like a, yeah. yeah. I think what you said, Kyle, the way I think of generals and I've been on hundreds, maybe a thousand, <laughs> at least 500 of them is like, you don't know what the outcome of this meeting is gonna be when you go into it. And, and you're looking for it constantly. So is it gonna be that I'm gonna be reading something that they're developing? Is it gonna be that we both love this book and we're gonna see if we're gonna go after the rights? Is it gonna be that I'm gonna pitch something? Is it just gonna be that we're gonna stay in touch and 
and bond over some cartoon that we both love. And I'm going to take them out for lunch next time I'm in LA. Like you don't know what the outcome is going to be, but you're constant, you're sitting there very actively thinking about at the end of this, when this, when this hour finishes, I need to be able to say, great. So next we're going to, and you just, you don't know what that is going to be at the beginning of the meeting, but you're constantly kind of naturally and, and looking for something that you're both going to share and connect over. And it, it could be something they have, could be something you have, could be uh, that you're both going to go, you know, you're both seeing the big movie that's coming out that weekend and you're going to email them about it once you've seen it. And you're just like, you're just looking to kind of <coughs> establish the beginning of a relationship. And yeah. first the, the TV show that Gemini did, uh, Mech X4, I did the pilot for that show. And the way, the, way, the way I got that pilot was 10 years earlier, I had a general with a woman who we just kind of hit it off and we stayed in touch. And I basically took her out for lunch every year for 10 years because we just, she was always interested in what I was doing. And I took a hundred people out for lunch every year, but she was one of them. And 10 years down the line, she was sitting in a meeting with someone at Disney and they're like, oh, if we just, if we knew someone that was in Vancouver that could do visual effects, that has worked with kids that, doesn't need to be paid a lot of money. Like, and she goes, oh, I know the perfect person. Um, and so that led to that opportunity, which then led to that show and led to all sorts of other things. But that's from maintaining a good relationship with many, many people um, over a long period of time. And those, you don't know where those opportunities are gonna come from, but they they eventually will, you know, as you're continuing to do work and, and, and continuing to be a good human being uh, with, with people. One question I had in the generals, they will tell you like something that they're looking for really specifically. And you get kind of excited because you're in the meeting and they're like, you know, I, I don't know what, but it'd be like, oh, we're actually looking for a genie movie. That's what we want to take in. We've got our first look deal with Netflix and we want to bring a genie. And you know, you're coming in with these different ideas, which might not be totally a genie movie. And then you're like, oh, that, that would be kind of interesting. And then you walk away and, and then you have to decide to be like, I don't want to do the genie movie, <laughs> but still keep that relationship, even though they were the ones that were kind of pumped about the genie movie, you know? And it changes every three months. So you just wait three months mm -hmm. and you're looking for something else. But I, I do think a lot of this we cover in that workshop, like I mentioned, how to get hired, pitch and sell. But one of the last things we talk about is have them talk about what they're looking for before you talk about what you have so that you can change whatever you have to fit what they're looking for. So <laughs> yeah. if they're looking for G movies and you were about to pitch an R-rated movie, but you think, oh, wait, actually the movie could work if it was fucking <laughs> raccoons, then you just, you know, you dance. Um, yeah. One thing I was curious about, Jim, we've known each other a long time and I've never asked you this. I'm just, and maybe it's not interesting, but I'm just curious, I think from, I mean, Tariq immigrated to Canada when he was a when he was five, but you immigrated as an adult. Was the experience as a filmmaker immigrating to BC, what was that experience like? Was it, was it different for you than every other sort of filmmaker that was trying to come up or was it the same? Um, I mean, I don't know. I couldn't really speak to the journeys of other people. Um, for me, um, it was really timing. You know, I did think my career would be in London. Um, and uh, we were hit, I still say we, even though I'm Canadian as well. <laughs> the Brits were still hit with, with the, uh, the recession in 2008. And I remember sort of film and TV just stopped. There was really nothing happening. And so that was sort of timing wise where, where I, I felt that, you know, it was a good time to move to Vancouver. Um, I'd always, I'd, I'd always loved it here. And I thought that uh, it would be kind of, a, I'd be here for a few years and, um, I very just quickly got involved with the indie community here. Um, I found that, you know, Vancouver being obviously a, a smaller uh, city than, than London, um, I was able to connect with a lot of people very quickly and build a community. And I just sort of got started straight away on those indie projects, not really knowing exactly where it would lead to or if at the time I'd be staying forever. Um, but it was that community that really sort of, uh, you know, got me going and we'd help each other uh, with our own kind of indie projects. And um, I decided to kind of work, you know, uh, 
I needed to kind of obviously make money and I decided that I wanted to, uh, what I was going to be working on full time, I, I want to help this part of my life, you know, the getting into uh, the path I want to get into directing. So I um, basically just started shooting and editing kind of commercials and corporate web videos and music videos and everything like that, that would, and that, that paid the bills, but I was always learning and that side was always helping this side. And, um, and like I said earlier, you know, those projects slowly became bigger, bigger and bigger. Um, but I did find, I don't know if this answers your question, but I did find coming to Vancouver, meeting this, this sort of indie film community was a, a kind of a, a lot easier than, than I found it in London. Yeah, well, you bring up something that I wanted to ask everybody, because um, I think it's something every artist never figures out how to solve uh, early on and everyone thinks that they're the only one that has this problem but trying to balance jobs you have to take that may not even be directing related with trying to become a director like I think that's where a lot of the um, being a director has a lot of privilege because you in a lot of way when you're starting out you need to be able to to do it for free <laughs> so you need yeah. to be in a situation where you can be putting money into your own projects you can be trying to do it without being paid. And that comes with a lot of sort of, uh, you know, support um, through just generational wealth and all sorts of things. I'm curious for all of you guys, what was that balance like? And, and what is it like today trying to figure out, you know, balancing, putting food on your table and, and following your dreams? What, um, I don't know, Asia, if you want to talk about that. Sure. I mean, I guess for my first few years of starting out, like I was doing a lot of freelance work. Like I would do graphic design. Um, I would do kind of work for, you know, clients and say like public health or like random jobs like that, um, to sort of balance like my passion project, just because obviously like having to pay the bills, but also doing something that was still creative as well. Um, so I think it just really came down for me, just like knowing my limit and not taking on too much and like burning myself out. Um, but also to just like staying really organized like I'm old school I have like a planner that I'm like very like particular about like I use it every day like I write down everything that I need to do so I make sure that I'm like not you know double booking myself and whatnot but I think it just comes down to to one hustling a lot you know just having to kind of do a lot of things at once but then also to just staying organized and making sure that you're able to, to maintain a bit of balance. Tariq how do you balance uh you're supporting your family and yeah. telling them you're gonna risk it all to become a filmmaker. Oh my God. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, I, I don't know, good or bad. Uh, I think, um, you know, uh, I'm not married to a civilian. <laughs> I think civilians, uh, I call them civilians, have a hard time understanding what we do and the sacrifices we make. Um, I feel like there's a lot of opportunities I gave up. I I I think that uh, according to my, I'm you know I'm from I'm Asian, so my family wanted me to become a doctor, so they're very disappointed that I chose to become an artist. And of course, right now I could have been you know driving around in a better car, having more money, but I would silently be, crying to yourself every night. Yes, I would be way unhappier. And so I I feel like. Uh, it's it's been really really uh, difficult to get here where I am in in, in, in my career and there's a, still a lot more to go forward um, and you, and yeah and there's things I gave up where there was uh, an opportunity to um, become an, like an AC uh, where I had to say no uh, there's because I I knew that if I or commercials there's this commercial opportunity to, I knew that. I wanted to do films and I wanted to do feature films and, and now uh, TV is getting really cool. I mean, it's been cool for a while, but it's getting really interesting. So I want to jump in that space. And I feel that uh, every day when I get up, I feel that I'm lucky that I'm uh, a part of this industry uh, because I get to play uh, for work. You know, like, like when I was a kid, you're in a sandbox and you're making stuff um, and, and you get lost in that uh that that creative stream of uh you know uh consciousness and i love that so but ha having said that um and this is where 
I think the, you know, uh, the sacrifices you, you, you have to make, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it would, I just had a, uh, a kid. So I just have a baby. It's a COVID baby. Uh, uh, my name is Amelia. You know, I know Kai likes Amelie. So uh, we also like that film. And, and I, fe- and I feel like when we didn't have a baby, we were like, oh, this is our lifestyle is fine. And we can do this for a long time and write and develop. And the, I feel like once I had the baby, uh, like this huge fire went off under my butt. And I started thinking that, and this is, and this is another question you asked before, but what's the difference? I lived in America for five years. Um, Americans are, there's more entrepreneurship down there and they're more uh, competition. They're more aggressive about stuff. And they're more business oriented. Um, and I feel that since my baby was born, I've never been more that way than I have now. So I'll kind of answer your questions, yeah. <laughs> kind of didn't, but you have to um, make the sacrifices for what you want. You have to, and, and it will cost you, but you have to think long-term. You have mm-hmm. to like, you have to believe in yourself. And you have to, I think you should talk about that after the, all this, you should talk about the infographic you posted on Facebook because that came at an opportune time uh, in, in my life where I was like, oh no, not again. Uh, you get so many no's in this industry and that was so beautiful what you posted, but we can talk about that after. So that's all I have yeah, to say. Yeah, well, I'm happy to talk about it. The, um, I think it, I mean, I love what you're saying. The, the quick advice is just have a kid and then you'll, then you'll definitely double down on what you need to do. Or you'll <laughs> give up. You'll, one of the two will happen. Um, I think it sort of comes down to the, the question the editor was asking us earlier. Um, I personally think it's, if you're trying to, if you're debating between how do I have a directing career while I also need to eat and stuff, I think it's, if you can, I think it's better to have any job that's directing than not directing. So like, I think it's better to direct the worst corporate videos, the worst music videos, the worst commercials, whatever, than to be being an AC or being an editor or whatever things only because you're, you're, you're directing, you're practicing the craft, but people start to think of you as a director. And that's a lot of the, that's the biggest thing is if you're constantly working, it's better to be your day job is a directing day job than a non-directing day job because then, because when it's not every hour that you're being an editor or, or something else, all the people you're meeting in that scenario are thinking, oh, well, this is what you really are. Directing is just a hobby. Whereas mm-hmm. if, you're, if you're busting yourself trying to make these corporate videos as, as incredible as possible and you do make them as incredible as possible, it just sends waves into the universe that say, I'm a director and I'm better than what I'm doing right now. And Hey, I just met a guy who's going to help me on the weekend to do my thing. And, and, Oh, this, the guy that owns this sofa company is going to invest in my film. And it just, it just, you're just in the spirit of being a director. So that would be another piece of advice. If you're kind of on that balancing thing, just to talk about the, the infographic that, that Tariq was mentioning, I, I, I'm a big data nerd as a lot of people who know me know, and I track a massive amount of, of data to do with the DGC, but also on my own career. I track every single project that comes across our desk. I track every single person that we meet, how long it's been since we've met them, like all sorts of things. And, and so I was curious, I, I created a graph of sort of every project that we've reviewed in the last four years, me and my co-director, sort of where they came from, what our decision was and what the outcome was. And sort of, you know, you can check it out on my Facebook if you want to check it out. But it basically, the, the, the thesis of it was a huge, very, very few things ever get made. <laughs> so this huge amount of stuff comes in the front door and very few, probably about, in my case, less than 10% gets made, which I think is probably higher than, than um, just in general, how many projects get made. Because when they come to me, they're already at the stage where they're looking for a director. So there's already been sort of a filtering process of many, many other projects that just got written and never got sold or got written and put on shelves or got written that got sold, did got stuck in development hell and never looked for director or whatever. So by the time they came to me, 10% of them got made. But when I looked at the ones that came through, the ones that were always the most successful that by far had the highest conversion rate of actually turning into something that got made was stuff that either I had originated 
or had come from someone I had a close relationship with. Um, in both of those cases, when it was, and it, some of those close relationships developed from generals over many, many years. And eventually, like Jen was saying, something came across their desk and they were like, oh, I need to give this to, to Zach. Um, but all the sort of stuff that's out there, just looking for directors that you're meeting cold on, in my case, 100% uh, of those never went, never actually led to getting shot. Um, we may have gotten hired, we may have worked for a while developing it, but they never actually ever, they never had that momentum that Kyle was talking about. Whereas the ones that are original, you can always keep pushing them. And the ones that come to you from someone, there's a closer bond where you're in it, you're in the war together with someone and, and um, it's just more likely to, to, to kind of go ahead. So check that out if you're curious. Um, last, we got one last question here that I want to get to. And if anyone else, this is your, your last warning. If anyone else has any questions, please post it because we're going to wrap up soon. Um, a question about uh, basically how do you get yourself out of being in a box? You know, how do you pitch yourself to do a genre that you've never done before? Um, mm -hmm. I think we've all, every director faces that. What do you guys think is the best advice for that? I think it's about finding the connections with the projects that you've done and bringing it because there's always going to be connections like you know i had the teen comedy it had heart to it and then you know was pitching on stuff that was kind of a actiony thriller thing and then so it's like finding the common things and threads within them that you take over and then and then with the project that you're going into always finding a personal connection to the story so that you are the right person for telling that of like, oh yeah, I can relate to the protagonist this way. Cause when I was a kid, this happened and I understand, you know, maybe the antagonist or something and going through and, and connecting it to something that you, um, that you've done or worked for. And then also I think pivoting and saying, this is what I'm aspiring to do. And this is what's so that there's energy moving into into the new, you know, genre. Yeah, I found, yeah, that's exactly right. Like, I think you you really do need to find those connections. Um, what connects you to the project, exactly as Kyle said. Um, and I also find going into these meetings, if you are, if this is a specific job you are going up for, you really have to position yourself in a way that you are the best person for this job. Um, and sell yourself that way. Why Why are you the best person to tell this story? Uh, because that's really all they wanna hear um, and uh, what they wanna know, right? It's a risk. Uh, if you've not done it before, it's a risk. So you gotta sell them why only you can tell this story. Um, I will say that when I've had this question before, it's usually like a, a genre, um, like sci-fi or horror or fantasy, for example, uh, where someone, you know, want, a director wants to get into that genre and hasn't um, done any work there yet. And I, uh, going back to what we spoke about earlier, I do advise uh, people, uh, directors, to create their own content as well. Um, it's tough because some of those genres, you know, sci-fi can get expensive, but there are ways to do it and work within a budget that you have. And so even if it's going out and creating a short in that genre that you want to get into, if it's a genre that you care about and that's where you want to be, then go up for those jobs, but also uh, make that uh, on, you know, on the side as well, make that short, make that passion project when you can. Yeah, you guys said exactly what I was going to say. So everything they said, and then one thing I'll add is that um, I actually had this come up on a recent pitch where um it was a horror thriller comedy and we've made horror thrillers <laughs> and the we heard ahead of time the head of the meeting they're not sure if you can pull off the comedy so we knew going in that basically we, already we're going into a, a pitch where they're not sure if we're they know we've done freaks but that wasn't that funny so can you do the comedy because this has both and the comedy is really important and so the other thing we did is we did everything that that Jim and Kyle mentioned but on top of it, we we just like went, we attacked the comedy side of it. And we said, the most important thing in this movie is the comedy. And here is here is why it's funny. 
here's the best comedic beats. Here's where we're going to execute those beats. And here's the way that we're going to make this funny that no other director is going to. And we just like, we broke down like all of these things throughout the entire script of like, where it was just like a thesis statement on how you execute comedy and film. Um, and it was just so evident that we uh, knew what we were talking about, that that question was completely removed. And afterwards, everyone told us, wow, like you guys, not only do you have the thriller horror side, but you, you clearly understand the comedy side. And we, and like Kyle said, we reached back to the very early days of our career and said, oh, we did do comedy. Of course, we've done this and we've done that, but it just wasn't what we were known for. And so sometimes it's really, um, my co-director and I, we often think of what are the things they're thinking that they're not going to say in the meeting as to why they're not going to hire us, whatever they are. If it's that you've never done this genre before, it's that you're not experienced enough, if you've never worked at this budget before, you're you're not the same gender as the main character, whatever the thing is, think of that ahead of time. What are the reasons they're going to say no? And then build the answer as to why that's not an issue into your pitch. Um, and that's always a, you know, a really smart way of, of kind of moving forward. Yeah, I would just jump on that and say that that is really, really helpful. And especially like taking a project out, they'll go, well, this is very similar to this project. And it really isn't. I mean, you know, there's a million cop shows, but they'll just go, well, well, this is really similar. Then to take that and beat them to the punch and then tell people in the, you know, your next meetings of like, yeah, there's this film and this is why it's different. So that they're already like, oh, you already thought about that. It's like almost, you know what the weakness is and you like Zach said, attack it. Yeah. Um, and so Mikesh has sort of a, a, a follow up question of sort of what if they've, you know, done a lot of research on your past work and stuff. Um, sometimes they have, sometimes they haven't. I think you still have to just kind of control that narrative and kind of highlight the part of your work that supports why you're, you're, you're perfect for this. Um, and that'll kind of do the most of the work for you, even if they can see that you've made documentaries in the past and this isn't a documentary. Um, talk about your narrative work, and then maybe talk about the part of your documentary thematically that, that taught you something about why, that, that no other director that comes in the room pitching on this is gonna know because you've experienced this certain thing. It's basically making you as specific as possible. Um, so with our last few minutes, I just wanted to ask this question to you guys in case you have any, any thoughts. It's sort of like looking into the future of BC's future. Uh, you know, you're all creators in BC, what are the things that could change in BC to take BC to the next level? Um, so there's many more creators that are being much, much more successful. If you were to wave a magic wand, what would be the things you would you would change or add that would allow BC to be more of an incubator for creative talent? Uh, that's a good question. I, th- I think right now it's getting more shows, uh, more of our content shot here. Um, and I think there, that, like I said earlier on in this discussion, that conversation is just sort of starting to, to happen. And I'm sort of uh, coming across that in generals now um, and have had a few talks recently with other uh, production companies about how important it would be to, um, to get a show made here, which is, which, is, um, which is great to hear and inspiring and it's, great that you know these people I'm talking to and pitching this show are f- kind of feeling that as well because it um it's hard selling a show anyway it's hard selling it anywhere and obviously if you sell a show um really I'll you know I'll shoot it anywhere but the dream really is to is to shoot something at home um and to get that project going I think if we can get more of that content um I'm t- talking TV, but obviously film as well. If we can get more content shot here um, and start kind of changing the narrative of BC that we're not just a service town, uh, we are a town full of creators as well. Um, yeah, I, I think that's uh, that'll, that'll change that narrative. Yeah, and it's an issue both with film and TV. I mean, telefilm's budget is massively disproportionate to the East Coast, which we've been putting pressure on them about. Um, and they're aware of the issue. So, and then every time we talk with them, we talk about regional proportionality, which is which is totally uh, off kilter with both the networks and the and the federal funders. So, 
I think that's a great point. All of us can be part of putting that pressure on them so that they yeah, know it's one third, right? It's 15%. We have 15% of the population and we get 5% of the money from telefilm. So that's, uh, yeah. Whereas Quebec is, uh, 50, you know, gets 50% of the money and they're 25% of the country. So I think there's some rebalancing that would be great to happen. And, and they're aware of that. And it's a big part of what the DGC does. Is there anything else you guys can think of Tariq, if you were to wait? Yeah, I, I feel out? like I've gotten a lot of, uh, like surviving, uh, <laughs> Uh, got a, a, a lot of money to telefilm for development and through Harold Greenberg Fund. And there's, uh, you know, there's sources that can help you. And, and, and I'm sure you all have had help from them. But in the feature world, world and but in the TV world, there's this thing where you have to have um, uh, a network, Canadian network signed to the project for it to get funding. And I feel that that really um, uh, doesn't let a lot of people who you know who who you know who, who don't have like day jobs and they want to be creators uh, to develop doesn't really help or assist them to develop uh, projects. TV projects are hard to develop; they're complex. Um, and I I don't know. Maybe BC has to do something bold, uh, which is like uh, uh, do it like start a. Uh, 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 creation incubation incubator program for TV in BC. They take a little small percentage uh, to make sure it's shot here, uh, but I'm sure something like that would um, uh, would open the floodgates. Hopefully, <laughs> in 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 more stuff uh, being made by us here, and then selling it down to the states and to the rest of the world because we definitely have the crews, right? So um, yeah, there is a. Um, I've been trying to create one myself, an incubator, but there is a, a small one uh, that if anyone's watching is interested in called the PSP, the Pacific Screenwriters Program, mm -hmm. that is sort of an incubator for screenwriters because they basically, there are so few screenwriters in writers rooms in BC that that's kind of trying to address that issue. So if anyone's interested, uh, you should definitely check that out because it's a great program Yeah, it is. where they incubate a show, uh, they create a little mini room and, and the showrunner is the mentor of all the new of all the new writers, and the showrunner gets a bunch of scripts written by the the writers to then go sell the show. So, um, and it's uh, currently financed by Netflix. So definitely um, check that out if you're interested. Asia, what do you think BC could do better to kind of support creatives? Um, well, this isn't necessarily specific to BC. I think it's just kind of across Canada, but like I would love to just see more risk taking and people taking chances on like emerging talents, especially BIPOC folks. Like, I just feel like it's such a necessary time. Um, you know, I think if there are opportunities for say shadowing, it's like, make sure you're paying people, make sure that you're giving a guarantee to direct down the road so that it's worth their time of coming out. Um, I just think there's such a need for more representation in front and behind the camera. Um, just making more space for diverse voices um, and just changing kind of like the, the narratives that we've been seeing for so long. Like, I feel like it's exciting because things are starting to change, but we still have such a long way to go. Like, I know Women in View is releasing their report at the end of this month, I believe. And from what I've heard from an inside source is that, you know, the amount of Indigenous women who are directing for television is less than 1% um, from their most recent report, which is so disappointing that, you know, we're, it's 2021 and things aren't changing. And so, I think just for myself as an emerging creator, like just, you know, it can be discouraging some time when, you know, you're just trying to do all the things you can do to just like get us, get your foot in the door, but it's sometimes it's just so hard to get someone to actually take a chance on you because there's so much resistance to kind of, you know, bringing in new people and, and that sort of thing. So I would love to see that. Awesome. Well, I'm giving you the magic wand so you can, uh, you can wave it and, and grant, uh, but yeah, I think we all agree and, and a lot is being done to try and to make that come true. Um, cool. I want to wrap it up. Um, thank you so much for all of your guys' time and everyone's questions. And uh, thank you for everyone who, who checked this out. Please check out directors.ca if you want to know more about all these incredible directors. And if you're a director, DGC member who's not on there yet, please send us your name and, uh, and we'll add you to the list. And uh, you can find out all sorts of uh, stuff that we're up to at members.directors.ca as well for all of our new events and follow us at Just Watch. Uh, what is it, Ryan? What's our thing? Just watch at just watch DGC, uh, or is it you tell me? Uh, anyway, I think that's our handle on social media. Just watch DGC. 
Um, and so thank you everyone so much for your time and for your wisdom. And I hope everyone who's been watching has really enjoyed it. And uh, can't wait to see all of the amazing work that you guys are gonna create. So thank you very much. Well, thanks everyone, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Yeah.